Thinking aloud. Conversations on the leading edge of knowledge and discovery with psychologist Jeffrey Mishlove. Hello and welcome. I'm Jeffrey Mishlove. Today we are going to explore consciousness in the multiverse. My guest is R.J. Spina, the author of Supercharged Self-Healing, A Revolutionary Guide to Access High-Frequency States of Consciousness that Rejuvenate and Repair. If you haven't seen the video, the short video documenting RJ's remarkable self-healing, I'm going to link to it right now on the right hand, upper right corner of your screen. RJ cured himself after having received multiple diagnoses, including permanent paralysis or paraplegia from the chest down, as well as a staphylococcus infection, diabetes, pancreatitis, Hashimoto's, autoimmune disease, hypothyroidism, and a syndrome called autonomic dysreflexia. RJ lives in San Diego, and now I'll switch over to the internet video. Welcome, RJ. It's a pleasure to be with you again. Likewise, Jeff. Thank you for having me. We'll be talking about the multiverse. I know uh, some months ago I interviewed Bernard Carr, a professor of physics in England, and he's uh, edited an anthology called Universe or Multiverse. So I know that in the field of physics and cosmology, this is a hot topic, but I have a feeling that when I talk to you about the multiverse, we're really looking at it more from an intuitive perspective perspective, your inner experiences of the multiverse as it pertains to consciousness. Yeah, yeah. So, absolutely. I'm um, through what we could call it altered state of consciousness, but though in a lot of ways, really, this consciousness here, <laughs> or the ego mind identity, five physical senses consciousness, is really the altered state of consciousness. And what I'm talking about is actually our pure state of consciousness. So, it could be the other way around in some way. Um but yeah, once we have sort of complete detachment and we know what we are, which is pure spirit or pure consciousness, that does make it easier to be able to do these things. But the level of detachment that that's needed to be able to explore these things can take, I mean, it, it can take lifetimes and lifetimes and lifetimes and lifetimes to build up this level of detachment. And at the same time, this level of detachment also is what speeds up the accrual or the deepening of sentience, which is what we call our, our love and wisdom and all our talents and abilities. As we detach from things, we become more and more and more attuned to what we really are. And as we become more and more attuned to what we really are, we're able to explore the vastness uh, of the multiverse and be able to perceive and understand it on a certain level. And then even what's beyond the multiverse. And for me, that's when it gets super, super interesting. Well, let's talk about that. What What is beyond the multiverse? So, okay. All right. So this is, yeah, this is, uh, in, in a way, this is near and dear to my heart. So <clears throat> uh, I'll, I'll relay the first time this, this occurred for me. It was a very long time ago, very long time ago. And I was really still, still a kid. So I, I, I was through an altered state or <laughs> the correct state of consciousness, I was able to sort of completely let go. And it's almost like I was being put on, on an elevator, so to speak. And I just kind of went up through everything. And, and it's like as if everything was made of glass, I was able to experience this frequency. And then I went up this frequency, this frequency. And then eventually I pierced through what I call the membrane of the, the 12th full dimension. And it was then at that point where... It, I was in, I guess we'll call it uncreated source or pure source. And there were two enormous sort of uh, spheres or they um, appeared to me as spheres. Maybe that was just my interpretation of it. Um, but they were enormous. They were, they were gigantic and they were a, a, a bit far away, if that makes sense. So I, I let myself go to them. And as I encountered them, I was able to interact a direct, intelligent uh, conversation with them. And as it turns out, 
they are not part of this God, but they are caught within God's gravitational force as a, as a way to explain it. And so I was f- absolutely fascinated by this because first off that they said they weren't part of God, but yet they were inside of God. And so I wanted to understand what that, what that really meant. And that's when I became aware of what the Hindu masters call the absolute or the all there is. Now the absolute or the all there is, is just that. It is all there is. And you could think of it as the totality of all, of, of all existence. And it's, it's a, it's a being. So in other words, it became self-aware and self-conscious on its own. It's not a, it's not a creation. It is existence itself. So all of existence is conscious on some level and some aspects of, of consciousness is super conscious if you want to look at it that way. But this absolute or this all there is became aware of itself. It became self-aware and it realized that it was everything in every single direction, up, down, left, right, frequentially, dimensionally, it just started to become aware that it was everything. And by the way, it noticed that it was divided into 12 parts, that it somehow was made up of 12, 12 components. And so this is the very beginning of its understanding of becoming self-aware, of existence itself becoming self-aware, which happened a very, very, very long time ago from a linear perspective. So these two huge entities started explaining this to me when I connected with them. They were explaining that they were actually part of the original uh, conscious awakening of the absolute. And in this conscious awakening of the absolute, it decided to make 12 creations in order for it to understand itself, to send a creation of itself in this direction, send a creation of itself in that direction, because it didn't know anything about itself, Jeff, down there. down. It's like we don't know anything about our foot, so we send a drone down our leg into our foot to understand what's actually inside our foot as an analogy. And so these two beings were part of that sort of original experimentation of creating these 12 other gods or these 12 other source entities for this, for this absolute, for this all there is to understand itself and explore itself. And it's part of those original energies that simply got caught up in the gravitational force of, of, of our God, of our source entity. And they're not the source entity, our God in and of itself, but they're just caught there. And these, these entities started explaining this to me. And as I, as I could resonate with it and actually become part of this consciousness, not just intellectually, but actually embody what was happening as they, as they relate it to me. In a sense, it almost allowed me to then continue to leave pure God, if you will, one hour way outside of the multiversal structure. And then we come into these areas where it's the exact same thing. It's now you run into a whole nother source entity or God and it's created its own environment. And some of those environments are absolutely nothing like this multiversal structure, uh, but it's an environment nonetheless. And these environments have creations within them, just like our multiverse has creations within creations, within creations, within creations. Same with these other source entities or gods. They have environments that have creations within creations, within creations of them. And what, I was able to experience is that there are 12 of these and we're coming back to that magic number of of 12 because as I said, the absolute or the all there is when it became self-aware, it realized that it was divided into 12. So it, it created 12 drones or 12 source entities or 12 gods to explore the various uh, regions of itself that it had no knowledge, no tangible understanding of itself whatsoever. And this absolute, this all there is, is only just beginning believe it or not, is only just beginning to understand the very nature of itself because it is all of existence. And we are housed at this moment, we are housed within one of those source entities or one of those gods within its creation, which is the the multiversal structure. And these 12 other gods, Jeff, uh, and the Bible refers to the Elohim. The Elohim, is, which means God's plural. So, the Elohim are the true source entities. They are the, they are the true co-creators. And that's what the, that's what the Bible is actually referring to is that these 12 other gods and aspects of these 12 other source entities or 12 other gods are interested in these, in the, uh, creations 
of its co-workers, of its other gods. So it sends pieces of itself into these other source entities' creations in order to experience and learn and also to help each one of these other source entities with their experimentation, with their creation, all at the behest of the absolute in order to understand itself in totality. Well, this sounds like a very powerful visionary experience in a way one could liken what you're describing to, to Dante's journeys through uh, heaven and hell and purgatory. Uh, but what is interesting to me, RJ, is that somehow all of this awareness was part of your remarkable healing process. And I'm pretty sure that the only reason we're discussing it now or that you want to share it is because you think it is going to be helpful to people. Yeah, that is yeah, that is the only purpose. Everything everything comes from love and wisdom. Everything is a direct result of love and wisdom. Uh it's all designed for us to know ourselves in totality, which is actually impossible. So it's a, a never-ending journey of self-discovery. Uh there is a, there there are such things as self-mastery for sure that do, that does exist and certain beings have been able to achieve levels of of self-mastery. Uh but the multiverse and everything is really just a multifrequential, multidimensional hall of mirrors to reflect back our own level of consciousness in order to understand ourself. And so our, our mind, even our human mind, has a blueprint. Everyone's does. Has a blueprint of the entire multiverse. And we simply populate it with our experiences and perceptions. And then as we populate it, it's kind of like those dolls within a doll, within a doll, within a doll, <clears throat> or which also works uh, very similar to a holographic nature. As we populate our our blueprint, that affects that affects what that's within, and what that is within affects what that's within, and so on and so on and so on. So as RJ uh, experiences these things, my higher self is experiencing these things. Source is experiencing these things. The other source entities are experiencing these things. And the absolute who directed all this, who created all this is experiencing these things. So it's, it's never ending. And it, it's so far beyond this sort of interpretation that I'm trying to give by, by using words. Uh, these things are so far beyond anything that I could really capture, which is why I try to use analogies and, tr you know, try to give it some make it some sense in a, in a logical fashion. But, but these states of consciousness, these frequencies, these dimensions, we are part of these things and they're, they're meant to be experienced for us to truly understand what life actually is. Well, I'm getting the picture of the nested dolls. It's, it's sort of like a, uh, I think mathematically, we might talk about nested hierarchies. And uh, it w makes me think that it probably uh, not only goes larger and larger and larger outside of us, but there's probably nested hierarchies within us as well. Yeah, that, exactly, Jeff. Exactly. It's, it's never ending. It's absolutely never ending. And, and one way to look at that is if we look at our just our, our chakra system, <clears throat> each one of the chakras has a, a certain amount of uh, vortices Within, for those that can see chakras, and I'm certainly not the only person that can see chakras, each one has a, a specific number of vortices in there. Those vortices represent the sub-frequencies with, within that main frequency band. So by the time we get to our crown chakra, uh, I, I believe there's 986 sub-frequencies just within the seventh full frequency band. And we're still in the first full dimension. And there's 986 sub-frequencies. And those are all the vortices that, that, that make up the crown chakra. So it is within and outside, all at the same time. And the, the intelligence that's behind this is so far beyond intelligence. There's no way for me to describe it, uh, uh, except I'll relate something that's very, very personal. A few, a few years ago, uh, when I started actually writing a, a second book, and I, I was getting the feeling that I would be communing, communing with God again. There would be a direct, uh, intelligent, interaction with with god with source and I, I could feel it i could feel it coming it's familiar i could feel it and i remember when it first started occurring again i was sitting by my uh porch on the island of Kauai, and the, the sun was right there and the glass doors were right behind me sort of like how close this, this window is it was right it was right beside me 
And just as, just as this communion, this reconnection was, was about to occur, the, the, the biggest, most beautiful butterfly I'd ever seen in my life came right up to the window and just kind of hovered there. And, and I knew, I knew it was taking place. And, and in that moment, I was able to interact again directly with, with God, with source, with, with creator. And what's so striking about it, because once this happens, there's no, it becomes part of you. God is this intelligence that is so unfathomable, so beyond anything that we could fully comprehend, no matter how advanced an individualized unit is, it's far beyond far beyond what we can understand. So this in, this intelligence that I was connecting with, I could feel it reducing itself just to be able to communicate with me. <laughs> uh, but at the same time, Jeff, this incredible intelligence, it was mixed with, with the playfulness of a child. And it's the most beautiful thing ever. Those two things together, this immense intelligence and the playfulness of a child, the innocence and the purity. And when it first happened again, I got, I got so excited. I got to be honest. I got so excited and I kind of snapped out of that communion. And the moment that I lost that playfulness, God was gone <laughs> once again. So you, we all have to maintain this purity and this innocence and this playfulness to be able to correct, uh, connect directly with with what it is that made everything here and then at the same time to be able to understand more and more and more of it that's really on us in terms of being able to evolve our sentience and consciousness and the more that we do that the more that we're going to be able to garner these these direct experiences with with god and and with other gods now when you were going through your healing process rj uh you were in the hospital, as I recall. Were you having experiences of these uh, multiverse levels at that time? Uh, yeah. The, so the multiversal experiences, we could say, uh, started happening as a little kid. I mean, it was, was kind of like my first memories of, of being RJ, if you will, whoever RJ is. Um, so this has always been a continuation Uh it was happening all the time as a kid. I would just leave my body. And, and as I think we talked about once before, first it was just sort of within the same frequency and I would experience where I am. And then I'd be able to experience different frequencies. And then I realized that I could experience really anything that I set my intention to, that I was totally free and connected to something much deeper than, than just what's here. And so I started exploring then. I, I certainly didn't have the intellect to understand what in the world I was doing because I was just doing it naturally. It's, I would say it was once I became 24, I started to be able to deconstruct it because I guess there was enough of an intellect to, to understand. But the, the, the healing itself, it, I wouldn't necessarily say it was related to experiencing, uh, the multiverse. That was really more of a very internal remembering of how the mechanics of self healing and self realization actually work. And it was through my body being destroyed. It, it, the veil was then removed and it was within my own consciousness that it was able to come back to me. And maybe in other incarnations, it, it was through these, this exploration that I, I have a feeling I do all the time, uh, that I garnered this wisdom or talent or it was just given to me. It was probably more likely. Uh, and then I remembered it. And then upon the destruction or the near destruction of my body, it was time to remember it. And the veil was lifted, and then it came back in terms of in terms of how to do it. So it, I'm going to try and rephrase what you're saying in in language that would make sense from a parapsychological perspective, and in, in terms of the literature of parapsychology and the many other discussions of parapsychology on this channel. I might say that on the one hand, you're having out-of-body experiences in which you travel through the many dimensions and levels of, uh, of the multiverse and, and frequencies and, and the relationship between frequencies and dimensions and so on. And, and then at another level, you get in touch with a very specific place, which I, I would call, let's say, the source of healing. 
It has to do with a, a kind of unified consciousness. Oneness with everything uh, seems to be the origin of healing, or you might just say source, or, or even God. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we could definitely look at it that way. It, it, it's, um, I guess we could say it's a level of consciousness or understanding that um, I've experienced, and so therefore it became a remembering. Uh, so it, it's something that I've already tangibly um, understood, and it just it just came back. I just I just remembered, but it probably does have to do with uh, exploration, which also does relate to our level of consciousness. So and this might be helpful as well, Jeff. Um, my understanding: most of us have heard the term "higher self," right? That we are a part of this much larger being, higher self, Godhead over soul, or what I call our totality, but they're all the exact same thing. So most people are familiar with higher self. Okay. My, my experience in terms of the structure of the multiverse of, of this source of our God is that <clears throat> there's five uh, genres of higher selves. And these higher selves are located at different places dimensionally and frequentially, dimensionally and frequentially within the multiverse. Now, where they're located frequentially and dimensionally relates directly to their level of sentience. So in other words, the more evolved or sentient something is, the higher in the multiverse that it actually resides. The less uh, sentient or evolved something is, the lower in the multiverse it resides. Now, nothing originates within the first full dimension, physical reality. Everything originates above that and then gets projected this is my silly octopus and tentacle thing that I do, right? So everything then gets projected from these higher frequencies and really higher dimensions, and they get projected downward in order to experience the physical universe because there's this is a very unique place. Every every place other than the first full dimension, there's there's no tangibility, there's no solidity, there's no physicality. So this is a remarkable a remarkable place to be. Well, somewhere in this picture, we also have and a just completed writing a lengthy essay on this topic, an afterlife that where uh, humans reside and probably many animals reside uh, after the physical body uh, dies. How, is, uh, does the afterlife have comparable levels? Is it parallel to what you've described or embedded within what you've described? How do these things relate? Yeah, Jeff, they're, they're embedded in everything that I just described, absolutely. So the first thing uh, that, you know, th these are the things that I tangibly experience. So I, I am, talk to dead people all the time. There's no such thing. You just simply move into a different state of being, right? Nothing is ever lost, e ever. So <clears throat> the first thing that happens uh, for a, a soul when it, when it quote unquote dies, it really just leaves its body. We slide in, we slide out. So as we slide out, we then go to exactly where we expect to go. So if the beliefs are, we'll say strong, the identifications, uh, we will then create an environment for ourselves that suits exactly our deep rooted belief. Whatever that belief is, it, it doesn't matter. So some people believe they're so bad that they're going to go to hell. So they will actually experience a version of that until they realize that this is just their own creation and then they'll leave it. Now it works both ways. So many souls create a version of what we'll call it heaven, create a version of heaven the way that they see it, whether Buddha is waiting for them or Jesus or, or Merlin or something, you know, somebody's waiting for them and they see all their relatives and this and that. So they will literally create, we're this powerful a creator. We are this powerful. We then create that experience for ourselves. And then we have that experience because that satiates a belief. And then once that belief has been completely satiated and we understand that we're not that belief, we then move on. Now we have to understand that there's no time with this at all. And one split second in these higher realms, 200 years can pass here. Okay. It's very, we have to experience these things for ourselves to understand. That's why sometimes deep, deep meditation goes on for hours and hours and hours and hours, but it feels like it was 10 minutes. Okay. And I've definitely experienced this. And I'm sure tons of people have experienced this. So we create the reality, Jeff, based upon our, our deep rooted beliefs. Once those evaporate and we have a better self-awareness, a better true understanding of self-awareness, we then go to various places. So sometimes we completely recommune with our higher self. Okay. And at that moment, the wave crashes into the ocean 
and the whole concept of individuality is gone. And you realize that you are the higher self, that you are a piece of this higher self. That's full communion. Okay. And that's when all individuality is, is lost. Now that doesn't necessarily have to happen. Sometimes what happened is the octopus, the higher self, you know, with the soul, you or me, it will pull it out just based upon where it feels it needs to be pulled out. So there might not be full communion with the higher self. There might be partial communion with the higher self, because let's say that aspect of that higher self doesn't necessarily require full communion with the higher self. Maybe it was operating with itself in a, in a very holistic, authentic way, and it doesn't need full communion. So it will operate somewhere within where that dimensional higher self is located and physical reality. And it will simply experience that. It will rest. It will recuperate. It will acclimate itself back to what it really is, which is a pure energy being. Then when it's ready, it will do what we call a life review when, when it's ready. And the life review is far more extensive than we understand because the life review also includes parallel conditions that we create for ourselves, And we create thousands and thousands and thousands of parallel conditions for ourselves. So upon one incarnation, we review all of those things. And then sometimes the life review always happens. And then sometimes upon what we call death, we only go up a little bit, just depending upon what the soul needs and how the higher self wants to operate. Because remember, it's still a tentacle of the higher self. So, so sometimes we don't have full communion. Sometimes we don't even have partial communion. Sometimes we simply exist in what we call astral realms. We still reside within the first full dimension. And we want to re, and we want to reincarnate. We want to go back. But the life review and all these things have to happen before we actually come back and, and, and do it again. But so it's, it's various, Jeff. There's not one place that we go. There's various places that we can go. And it's just dependent upon how that soul was operating during the incarnation. And then also what that soul really is, the higher self, what that higher self has plans in terms of that soul or that particular aspect of itself. Now, you use the metaphor of the octopus with its tentacles as the higher self, and it reminds me a little bit of a description uh, by Frederick Myers, uh, presumably dictated by him through an automatic writer, Geraldine Cummins, in the 1930s, a classic book called The Road to Immortality, where he's describing from, from the discarnate state what it's like over there, and he's referring to group Souls. He said, we are, uh, as we go into these higher levels, we discover we're part of a group soul. Maybe there are 20 other individuals, maybe 2,000 other individuals as, as part of our group soul. And uh, is that what these tentacles possibly refer to? Yeah, it, it, it can. It, it's hard for me to comment on someone else's level of awareness and sentience, but it certainly uh, smacks of what it is that I'm, what I'm talking about. Um, <clears throat> I think what's really interesting about full communion with the higher self, which we can do while incarnate, we don't need death for any of these things. Because clearly I'm experiencing these things and I'm still, quote unquote, al alive. So we can, we can experience these things while we're incarnate. And by the way, that's really the point, is to be able to do this while we're still in incarnate. Because that really changes everything for yourself and for everybody when we're able to, to do this. So my experience with going going back to the higher self is that it's kind of the opposite of really what uh, I've always heard people talk about or explain. Um, I use the analogy of the wave crashing into the ocean. There's this seemingly um, independence of the wave for a moment. You could think of that as a lifetime. And then uh, the, the moment that the lifetime is over, the moment that the wave crashes back, it be literally becomes part of the ocean once again, and there's no individuality. So when we demise, when our physical body demises, and we literally go all the way back up to our to our higher self. The experience is that my individuality is is gone. There, it becomes no self. And so we talk about the ego dying, and that we remain the observer. This I I actually experience the opposite of that. I my my experience is that it's different from what people talk about. So when I experience the my totality, my higher self. I'm just, I realize at that moment, my individuality is gone and I'm actually everything. I am all of this. I am the higher self. I'm, I'm part of it. I'm now the ocean once again. And the interesting thing is, Jeff, is that what I have encountered in this, in these meditations 
is all the different personalities that that octopus has projected. So all the different lifetimes, you could say, that that octopus has created through projecting pieces of itself within within the, the first full dimension of the physical universe. And it's all retained. It's all there. So you actually see all your different lifetimes. They're all you. And all, and all of them are you. It's all, it's all one thing. And so the individuality or the observer self is totally gone. And what, what remains is all the, all the experiences. It's almost like, it's a ridiculous analogy is, do you remember Silly Putty? <laughs> you take Silly Putty and put it on like the comics and it has a perfect uh, imprint of it. Okay. Everything is preserved. Everything is preserved. Everything is recorded. Nothing is ever wasted. Nothing is ever thrown away. Ever, 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 ever. And so all of the lifetimes, all of the personalities, all of the egoic traits are there. And in that moment, you realize that you're all of this and all of this is you and the observer self is gone. So that that's what I experience. And these group souls, I think I have a feeling that this person is referring to are these different tentacles. But in, in order to experience all of it, you have to be in full communion uh, with your higher self and then everything that you have been are and believe it or not will be is already contained within the higher self and you can you can see it all and experience it all concurrently now we all dream i'm pretty sure everyone who's watching this video or listening to it right now has dreams and i dreams seem so very alien to our normal sensory life i wonder uh, how does the world of dreams fit into the this multiverse it's a good question jeff because dreams can be a couple of different things so uh dreams can actually be a, a parallel condition or a parallel reality that that we're having so it's another version of of us that we're not attuned to, if that if that makes sense. It's like a a radio can can flip onto all these different stations. So we have all these parallel conditions going on at once. We just can't experience them. We can only listen to one song at a time, <clears throat> you know, with our radio because our brain is attuned to one one single reality at a time. So sometimes dreams are literal parallel conditions that we're experiencing. Uh, sometimes. Our, we'll, we'll call it our subconscious, and I could probably even explain that better, but we'll call it our subconscious is going to create an environment for ourselves so we can work something out in a safe way. So having an experience here, there's consequences because we're, we're inside a, a suit, which is easily damaged, easily demises, you know, easily gets sick, et cetera, et cetera, right? So it's not necessarily the safest place to um, have certain experiences because the incarnation could end. So sometimes our, our conscious mind, and this also has to do with our, our higher mind along with our guides and helpers, what people call guardian angels, which are something different. Our guides and helpers will, will create an environment along with our consciousness for us to work something out that's troubling us or something that it is that we need to, we need to see and we need to understand so we can move past in a safe way. So that's the second thing that I've experienced with dreams. And then another thing is simply we experience uh, the astral realm. We are simply literally experiencing the fourth frequency, the fifth, the sixth, the seventh. And the, the astral realm in a lot of ways uh, is unstable. So because a lot of the astral realm is being fed by our emotional and mental projections. So we actually create things. Literally, if the belief is strong enough, we create something and these creations actually exist within the astral realm. So uh, if people believe in, in, in something or someone strong enough, it, it, it becomes real. Like literally, it, it, we're giving it energy. It actually be becomes tangible in these realms. So I've found for myself that it's normally one of those three things. It's a parallel condition. It's our own subconscious mind with the help of our guides and helpers to work something out. Or we're simply experiencing uh, a higher frequential state that still relates to this incarnation, but we're just in a higher frequency band. Traditional religions have a, a view of these things. Almost every religion has some description of what you're talking about. And, and typically, uh, these realms are populated, as you've suggested, guides and helpers and angels. And also, uh, you find in traditional religions a demonic element. And I wonder, 
what you think of that. From my perspective, um, demons and, you know, some people are going to be like, oh, that's not true. But this is what I experienced. There's no such thing. That's from a, that's from a certain perspective. Astral entities absolutely exist without a doubt, without a doubt. Now, if you're viewing it from a religious perspective, you would call them demons. Okay. If you re if you viewed them or experienced them with complete and utter detachment, you would actually see them from what they actually are, which are astral entities that cannot uh, exist through their own energies. They actually have to feed upon the energies of others like a parasite. So this is what an astral entity actually is. Now, they can feed upon your fear, and they normally do. They feed upon low-frequency energy because they can't create their own sustenance. Just like a parasite needs a host, astral entities need to exist upon feeding, uh, feeding on energy. And they feed on low-frequency energy. They can't feed on energy that exists above them. So they can't feed upon bliss, compassion, wisdom, gratitude, love, joy. They cannot feed upon those things because those things go right past them. They're beyond them. So what these astral entities are, what people call demons, they feed upon our low frequency um, expressions, low frequency thoughts, low, low frequency feelings, low frequency behaviors. And this actually sustains them and they grow. Now, so that to me is what uh, a demon is. Now, people have very strong beliefs about demons. And so the stronger and more that the more and more people believe in them, the more they actually become real because we're actually giving them energy. So in a sense, we could say that these demons exist, but they only exist within the framework of our unawakened mind and we make them real, if that, if that makes sense. So it all has to do with the perspective, complete detachment. You wouldn't see any demons. You would see astral entities. They are real. Um, this is really what, from my experience, this is what a, uh, a possession is, uh, and an exorcism is when, uh, an astral entity, a large astral entity or a group of astral entities is feeding upon the energies uh, of an incarnate soul and they have to be removed. So entity removal for those that are a little more, uh, we'll say advanced healers, they know exactly what I'm talking about and they may even be able to do this. I've done plenty of these. They're real. It has nothing to do with religion. It has to do with a parasite, sometimes a group of parasites. And th the larger the parasite, the more level of intelligence that it has. And it becomes, we'll say, trickier <laughs> to, to get rid of them. But they, none of them can withstand the power of love, the power of wisdom, the power of compassion. And if you're connected to something much deeper, they, they, they stand no chance whatsoever. So from my experience, it's really astral entities, Jeff. But astral entities are absolutely real. Well, you have talked about this nested hierarchy, the God of God and the God of that God and, and so on. Is, would the same thing be true for negative entities? Hmm. Well, uh, yeah, I was just kind of looking into that. So it seems like once we get past the seventh frequency band of the first full dimension, we have to orient ourselves towards uh, authenticity or what from a human perspective would be, we'll call it good, right? Um, so there's very limited, uh, there's a limitation in terms of negativity from a human perspective. It's very limited. So once, once you get to the seventh, you can't go any further unless you start to open yourself up to a more holistic understanding because the environment just becomes so much more holistic. And so therefore you can't keep a narrow, closed minded or low frequency way of operating and experience these higher frequencies, these higher realms and these higher states of consciousness. So it would appear that, um, negative, we'll use the word negative, negative entities are always, are always extremely limited in, uh, in their power and in their understanding. Let me push you a little further on that, because I hear from viewers about these things from time to time. And in, in some of the literature, for example, I think in Milton, John Milton's great work, Paradise Lost, a great epic poem from the Renaissance era, he suggests that Satan can actually be very seductive, can appear to be. The Antichrist, some religious believers would say, appears to be very 
very loving and very compassionate and all the good qualities that you would uh, be drawn toward. But then, for whatever reason, in whatever way, I have never figured that part out, it turns out to be other than that. People get seduced by the, the loving feelings of what is actually a negative entity. Does that make any sense to you? Yeah, yeah, it makes perfect sense. So, uh, I mean, that being does, does exist. Uh, it operates, I would say, it's the one exception to the rule in that it operates on a similar level as what we would call an ascended master. So it, it is a, it is a very uh, powerful and wise being that is simply very interested in the low frequencies. So it operates in a very low frequency way. So that's really what that's about. Uh, I would even say that you and I wouldn't even be, be having this conversation. If it wasn't for that one being, because in the, from the, this is my understanding from the very beginning of the idea of creating, uh, humanity, there were, there were uh, certain beings, there were three beings that were in charge of the form and the function and the creation of humanity, because the idea was to give, to imbue them with individualized free will, because the idea was that ep the consciousness evolution could be greatly increased through its efficacy by allowing everyone to evolve in their own way in their own time. So that, that being known as Satan or Lucifer, um, was, was part of this process of, of, um, those three, those three beings about humanity it was greatly involved in the very beginnings of humanity. Now, what that being did was it accessed the, the Akashic records and was able to see the future, the past and future of humanity, all of it. Because everything has already happened, which I know is very hard to, for our mind to understand, but that it has. So we're just on one page. Like when you're reading a book. If you're on page 26, you don't know what happened at the end, but the end's already written. But you're not there yet because your attention is on page 26 as an analogy. Okay. So that being accessed the Akashic Records and it discovered that not only could humanity ascend the frequencies and never need to incarnate again, it could also plummet. The frequencies, it, it could get immersed and addicted to the low frequencies and, and we could, in a sense, get stuck here. Now, what that being did is it didn't share that information. It kept it to itself because it wanted the experiment to go ahead. Now, if, if that being had shared that information, there probably would have been adjustments made so that consciousness or our human experience and alien experience <clears throat> we wouldn't have necessarily had the opportunity to get immersed or stuck here, which is what we, you know, we've talked about karma and how that works. So simply that being didn't share it because it wanted the experiment to, to go forward. Now, my understanding, other than that, that being has had nothing to do with humanity whatsoever since then. It's long gone and, and far, far away from anything having to do with humanity. It's people's, uh, unawakened mind through beliefs, superstition. Uh, that they believe that this being somehow is, somehow has any control over this realm. Well, whatever we we give control over, no one has control over us at all. I, and I hope everyone listening and watching begins to realize this: that there no one has any control over you whatsoever. Your your limitations begin where where your self discipline ends. That's beautifully put, R.J. I hope our viewers remember that phrase. Let me ask you one more question before we conclude, because uh, we've had many interviews on this channel about extraterrestrial intelligence, alien intelligence, the overlap that seems to exist between alien intelligence and the afterlife. You hinted at that. And also uh, the overlap that seems to exist between alien intelligence and various uh, manifestations of astral entities, or uh, sometimes people refer to creatures and, and the like. Do you have any insights about that? Oh, sure. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so aliens, I would say at one point, Jeff, I'm trying to remember when, but I, I don't know, uh, five years ago, seven years ago, something like that. Um, I, I was interested in, in having a lot of communication with aliens. So I would meditate and go really essentially within the astral realm and sometimes up into the eighth full frequency, which is really outside the astral. And this was simply to communicate with aliens. So I wanted to understand uh, how they see things, how they operate, what their, what their view is. Um, 
uh, and I, I probably did this every day. I would say Jeff for maybe like four or five months, it became something I was interested in. I need, I, I guess I needed to explore it on some level. Um, and so that's what I did. I would communicate with aliens all day in a state of meditation. And uh, the main thing that I took away from it is that they're operating just like humans, just in a, in a slightly more holistic way, because it's kind of like being underwater and then being on land. So the, the, the aliens that exist in the fourth frequency, fifth, sixth, seventh, and we call these dimensions. It's not, these are frequency bands. It's in the first full dimension of the physical universe. So they're operating in a more holistic way. So in other words, they're in a more expanded state of consciousness because their environment is already more connected and more holistic and in a higher vibratory state. So they operate that way. But the most interesting thing for me in terms of doing that every single day and talking to hundreds of different kinds of aliens was that they operate a lot of the same way that human beings do and that they're still operating with belief systems. They're still operating in terms of concepts and ideologies. They're still, they still have a way in which they live. So in other words, they're still operating with their own self-imposed limitations based upon their own level of consciousness. They simply just exist within a higher frequency and a higher realm. And we could say they're more advanced. And in that way, they are more advanced, but these are not self-realized beings. These are not enlightened beings. These are not incarnate masters. And so the conversations that I would have with these, it was really, it was really me answering questions about how I was doing what I was doing. They were fascinated with the idea of altering, uh, you know, my own electromagnetic frequency of my brain in order to experience these, these different frequencies and, and then communicate with them. So it was fascinating. I mean, I did it every day for a while, but ultimately, I felt I, I wasn't learning anything because uh, they were more interested in what I was doing and how I was able to do it. And I would answer questions about how I'm able to alter my consciousness and experience all these things. So uh, aliens are real. They're everywhere. They're just outside of our physical sensory perception. And when you exist in a higher frequency, you can make yourself visible to the lower frequencies and then you can make yourself invisible. So we really need to understand this. And this is part of this sort of conundrum about where's the proof, where are the end? When you exist in a higher frequency, you can make your presence known by dropping down in a certain frequency. If you want to disappear, you will simply disappear and make yourself invisible to our physical sensory perceptions that attune, that are attuned to these lower frequencies. So they pop in and pop out whenever they like. If we alter our consciousness, and I'm obviously not the only one that does this, if we alter our consciousness, we can see everything that actually exists in the fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh frequency. It's packed. It's absolutely packed. And there's also versions of human beings that exist in the fourth, fifth, sixth, and seventh. So it's not just quote unquote aliens. And by the way, we're all aliens. No one's from here. No one's actually human, right? The physical universe is like a vacation where you experience physical reality. None of us are actually human. None of us are actually alien, but they exist. They're everywhere. They're fascinated with human beings. They're fascinated with our evolution. They often interject themselves into uh, into our experience by mixing their DNA. That's been done over and over and over again. That's why human beings look so different. If you look at the wide variety of, of how human beings look, it's, it's that is actual 100% genetic manipulation by higher frequency beings, 100%. So, you know, eventually we'll be able to prove this. Uh, and we might even be able to prove it now, but maybe people don't want anyone to actually know this. But they're everywhere. They're fascinated by us. Uh, most of them are rooting for us. Some aren't. Some are kind of predatory. And that, that's okay. It's all part of the evolution of consciousness. Uh, but it was a fascination for me for, like I said, I guess like four months or something like that where I would do it daily. But ultimately, I, I realized that I'm here having a human experience and my work needs to be tailored towards humanity and working with humanity, not necessarily entertaining questions from aliens. It seems to me, RJ, that uh, all of this, this journeying that you're describing through the multiverse, through all of these dimensions and frequencies, uh, preceded your illness and your remarkable healing. So I'm thinking for the benefit of our viewers now, this has been a very mind-expanding conversation into realms that most of us don't normally even consider. And I presume that uh, if 
our viewers get nothing else out of it, it'll be sort of an opening to the possibilities of such things as, as the healing you yourself experienced. Absolutely, Jeff. Uh, it, it's everyone's uh, destiny to be able to to be able to self heal, to be able to become self actualized, self realized, whatever, whatever, however you want to say it. It's everyone's destiny. It's it is the evolution of consciousness itself. It is inevitable, and in some ways, it's already happened. Which I know our mind can't really fathom that. But when you're outside of space and time, you can look down and see that everything has actually already occurred. And so humanity is going to realize these things about itself. And humanity has realized these things about itself. And that's why we all feel that we can self-heal. It's why we all feel that we can become self-realized because many of us have. It's a memory. It's been done. This is exactly the case with myself. As a kid, I would say, if I got sick, I'm just going to heal myself. Who says that? Unless that's actually a memory, right? No one said that to me. I didn't read it. And I couldn't even read at that point. So... I knew it was within me. So this is within everyone. There's nothing special about RJ. Absolutely nothing. I don't even know who RJ is. Okay. I'm here because I love all of you with more than I can ever express. And there's nothing that I wouldn't do, include incarnate into the lower frequencies to, in order to be able to move consciousness forward, to be able to share the wisdom and love that comes through me. Because the wisdom and love that comes through me is the same wisdom and love that's within you. All of these abilities and talents, everyone will be able to do these things. That being said, this takes dedication. This takes devotion, serious dedication and serious devotion. Even in this incarnation, I did, I have dedicated myself relentlessly, relentlessly to the expansion of my own consciousness and the healing of my body. I don't dibble dabble in anything. I do it. And so when humanity starts to harness their will properly in accordance with their level of sentience, they will be able to do all of these things that I'm doing. They'll be able to do more of these things beyond what I'm doing. Without a doubt, there's nothing special about me whatsoever. The only thing I'm good at is getting out of the way so I can let the truth come through. Everyone can do this. Practice, practice, practice. Dedicate, dedicate, dedicate. Do not immerse yourself with the idea that you're human. This is the limitation. This is the whole ego mind identity for those that have gotten my book, why I ramble on and on and on about the ego mind identity, because it's the only block to your consciousness. It's the only block to these gifts, abilities, talents, however you want to call it. It's your association with the mind body that reduces your supreme confidence, consciousness to what I call body consciousness. That is the, that is the only limitation. And once you free yourself through detachment, these things that I'm talking about, you, you, you will experience these things for yourself. And that's the point. So you can see it embodied in me. And then you can know that it's real and it can be taught. And then you can do it yourself. RJ, what a joy to be with you once again and to be able to share your vision, your passion, your determination with our viewers. And of course, I'm pleased to let our viewers know that we plan many more conversations after this one. Jeffrey, it's always my pleasure. Uh, we have a deep connection. It's absolutely wonderful. I enjoy every moment of it. Thank you very much. Thank you, RJ. And for those of you listening or watching, thank you for being with us.